Thank you for joining us today for a conversation with Minnesota's Commissioner of Employment and Economic Development, Steve Grove. We're gonna talk about navigating the economics of COVID-19 here in Minnesota. This is one in a series of virtual conversations that Thunheim, a communications consulting company, has hosted since COVID-19 altered the way we work and live. Making connections is an important part of our daily work, connecting people, ideas, organizations. So we appreciate the time and effort each of you is taking to stay connected, and in particular, appreciate your joining us virtually today. I'm Kathy Thunheim. I'm the CEO and principal of our company. We're an agency that works with clients to help them be better understood by the important stakeholders that they have. Our offerings include public relations, public affairs, digital services, and management consulting. Much of our work is done at the intersection of business and government, which brings us to why we're here today. I'm honored to welcome Commissioner Steve Grove for a conversation about how COVID-19 has altered Minnesota's business landscape in recent weeks and for the foreseeable future. Commissioner Grove was appointed to lead deed at the beginning of, of Governor Wall's term, uh, and he brings extraordinary business experience to the role. We in Minnesota are very, very lucky to have him. Many of the announcements that have been made to date about aid packages available for businesses and for workers are a direct result of the work led by Steve and his team at Deed. Before we begin, let me remind everyone, this is a live web conversation. We are at the mercy of Wi-Fi connections, so hope for the best and know that if there are any technical glitches, they will be brief. Our team will be on it. On the right side of your screens, my digital colleague, Nick, will be posting additional context and resources in the chat bar, so watch for those. We're also recording this conversation and it will be available later on Tunheim social channels. So let's get started. Welcome, Commissioner Grove. It's great to have you with us. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks for having me. Excited to chat. You know, I've been, I've been mentioning to people in conversation these last few days, when you start a conversation and say, how are you doing? It used to be a throwaway line and now it feels like a sort of an important check-in. So let me start there. How are you doing? You know, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. I would say that, um, I'm actually grateful to have an opportunity to, to help right now. I think for so many of us at, at our Department of Employment and Economic Development, to have a way to help Minnesotans, to be able to focus our energy, because we're human too, we have nervous energy just like everybody else, but be able to focus that on, on helping people is, is really a gift. So I, I'm doing pretty well. You know, I think all of us are, are working hard, uh, people across government and business and elsewhere are trying to navigate this moment. And um, I will say that this is my first time in government service, so I, you know, I'm learning as I go here, but it's just been really inspiring to be amongst public servants like those I work with at Deed who are just built for this kind of moment. You know, they're yeah. just ready. For those for who don't know, share just a minute about your history before you got to government service, because it's a pretty great one. Yeah, well, um, this is, yeah, I was in the private sector before, so I um, spent the last 12 years at Google, uh, first at YouTube, building our first kind of news and political division there, and then at, at Google, ramping up our, our social media efforts and then building a team called the News Lab that was focused on helping news organizations across the world survive a, a truly disruptive moment as the internet has changed the economics of news so so starkly. So yeah, my background's in tech uh, and in journalism. I'm originally from Minnesota, but uh, moved away pretty soon after high school and just came back a couple of years ago after 20 years away. So glad to be back and here with my family and, and young twins and, and glad to be working for the governor at a time when uh, you know, Minnesota needs government to, to really step in and help. Well, as I said at the outset, we are very, very fortunate to have you. So uh, thanks for your government service. Yeah, thank you. How would you, dis how would you summarize Minnesota's approach to helping businesses during COVID-19? I think I just sort of, what's the philosophy that you guys are bringing to the task? Yeah, well, I think the first philosophy is protecting the health of Minnesotans. And so that's why the person you hear from second most in the state every single day is Jan Malcolm after Governor Walls. And so that is just the priority that the governor, I think, rightly takes in every decision. But so many of these decisions and so many of the things that we're doing are complex. And so the economics of this, the you know, economic impact of it are also on his mind all the time. And so, you know, our philosophy there is how do we minimize the destruction that this virus clearly has on our state's economy and start with those who are most affected? So really the philosophy is start with the most vulnerable people and, and help them first. So that's why the very first thing you saw us do was just open up unemployment insurance. You know, this, this program that has been around since the mid 1930s when Franklin Roosevelt, you know, launched it uh, and, and few people ever want to have to think about, uh, we need to make it open for people to use. And so uh, that was the governor's first executive order, which was just to, to reclassify what it meant to be separated from work to, uh, to no fault of your own, which, 
know, global pandemic is clearly a use case for that, but we need to make that clear. So we're starting with the most vulnerable, you know, after unemployment insurance, and there's a lot more we can talk about there, but we, we then focused on small businesses. Because I think, you know, the smaller the business, the harder the challenge here. And so we know that almost half of Minnesotans work for a small business. So that's a huge cross section of our population. And so we started with small businesses too. And so we're trying to start with most vulnerable and move outward from there. And then the, the kind of the, the complex dance we find ourselves in in state government is how, how do you enable every possible lever you can at the state level while not overlapping what the federal government's offering? Because they have so many more resources. You know, they can print money, they can go into debt. You know, you don't want Minnesota taxpayers to be paying money to help businesses they could get from the feds anyway. So that's, that's kind of the strategic exercise in some way is how do you leverage that federal funding, bridge the gaps with some state funding, and just get the most possible ROI, essentially, that you can for businesses and workers in our state. And that's, that's something we're, we're navigating every day. Yeah, that's great. So let's dig into a couple of those places. And let's start with the unemployment insurance. What steps has DEED taken to make sure independent contractors and gig economy um, folks have some benefit as well? Yeah, we hear this question a lot, and it's such an important one, especially as our gig economy has just exploded in the last five years, or even really just in the last two. What people I'm sure know is that unemployment insurance doesn't traditionally cover those workers unless they have signed up in, in a tax bracket that they themselves were paying into a trust fund for unemployment insurance. So bottom line is this system wasn't built for the gig economy. <laughs> and so how do you retool it for the gig economy is the big question. We as a state, nor can any state, do that on our own. The federal government has to act there, and they have. They have passed uh, additional unemployment benefits in a disaster situation for gig economy workers and for those who are independent contractors that will allow us as a state to pay out unemployment insurance-like payments to those who haven't been covered by that program in the past. It's taking longer than I would like, if I'm honest with you, because the federal government still has to give us guidance on what those payments should look like. And we don't have any, any wage history for those workers, which is how we essentially calculate what you deserve. Right. So, uh, but we're, we're building all the technical infrastructure to do that on our platform. So that as soon as the federal government gives states guidance, we'll be right in line to move on those payments. We hope it's a matter of days, could be weeks. We talk to the Department of Labor every day, but that's such a critical issue for Minnesota businesses and workers who who aren't covered by the traditional program. Yeah, it's such an important piece. You know, in businesses like ours, we're working with freelancers and creative folks all the time. We have a fantastic population here in, in Minnesota, and it's, uh, it's heartbreaking to think of uh, how scary it has to be. Yeah. So then let's talk about small businesses. Uh, how would you highlight what some of the um, resources that you're, you're making available to small businesses? Let's go through that. Yeah, you know, so the first thing that we wanted to help small businesses take advantage of was the federal government programs offered through the SBA. And so there's some work we had to do immediately just to qualify Minnesota as a state that could draw those funds in, and we were one of the first to do it. So we, we opened up those funds quickly for Minnesota small businesses, and essentially the SBA is offering disaster loan, uh, a disaster loan program that allows businesses to take out loans of up to $2 million dollars at a very low interest rate, um, some of it forgivable over time that will help help them stay solvent at a difficult time. The, the program is a little slower just by the nature of being a federal government program than businesses might like. And so we additionally have adopted a few state government programs as well. One of them is a, a small business emergency loan program that has $30 million in it. We offer loans of between 2,500 up to $35,000 at 0% interest. So it's an even better interest rate than, than the federal government. They're 50% forgivable, and they allow small businesses to kind of bridge the gap, essentially, between now and when federal dollars can come. So that was an important move that we made. We also allowed cities and counties to open up their evolving loan funds that come from state dollars so that they can add an additional $28 million into the market. And then along with the legislature, we partnered on passing a small business loan guarantee program because you know one of the things we're trying to do is how do you get private sector lenders more involved here, especially when loan applicants are not going to be super attractive to them given the state of the economy. How do you make that a little less risky? So we have a loan guarantee program out there. There's $10 million in it. That's not big money, but it's some money. And it guarantees up to 80% of a loan amount that an applicant would make. We've got about 40 banks signed up for it so far. So we're trying to leverage up to 25, maybe $30 million more worth of money from the private sector or private market too. So those are three of the big ones. I'd say, you know, for, for any small business, start at the federal 
uh, programs first, just because they take longer, they have bigger money and better terms. And, the, and we're going to ask you to do that anyway, if you apply for a state loan, because we want to make sure people are going to the feds first and then, then move on down to the state programs from there. Great. Really, really helpful. Thanks for that. I know, you know, prior to COVID-19 entering our lives, you've been really focused uh, on Minnesota's innovation and the startup economy here. Um, talk a little bit about what you uh, are seeing. Um, are there are there hopes that we can maintain some of that momentum on the other side of this? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. It's uh, It's been such a big focus of ours in the first year of our, our time at Deed. And, you know, Startups similar to small businesses face a lot of challenges in moments like this. So one of the things we've done is just work with the SBA to make sure that a lot of those levers that are available for small businesses apply to startups too. And there's some kind of annoying technical differences where it might not always apply. So we're trying to work through that with the SBA and connect startups to the SBA for more guidance there. Um, we're also going to partner with Generator, which is a great startup accelerator in our state to run a a workshop, sort of a how-to workshop for startups and how to navigate this moment. I think it's going to be I want to say it starts on April 6th, the 10th or something like that. So we'll, maybe we'll share more information in the links that Nick or others can circulate. But um, yeah, we want to do some outreach there too, to make sure that we can give a startup lens to this for, for founders. Great. Great. As you know, Minnesota has a proud tradition of business, business and civic leadership coming out of the private sector. And I know there are innovative companies that are coming up with um, things they think can help. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what's the best way for private sector folks who think they have something to, to contribute, what's the best way for them to do that? That's a great question. There are lots of ways that the simple answer to that is to email an email address that I'm going to give you right now, which is hsem.ppp at state.gov.us or state.mn.us. We'll, we'll circulate it so people don't have to write it down from my right. clumsy relaying of it. But the broader, the broader way is this. We have a state emergency operations center that is set up to try to engage as much of private sector help as we can get on a bunch of different vectors. And the governor has given us all in government different lines of effort he wants us to focus on. So getting more PPE available for hospitals, generating more uh, ventilators, getting more testing capacity in the state. Uh, the group that I'm leading is economic security. How are we leveraging the private sector for economic security? So each of those efforts has essentially like a private sector counterpart. In our case, it's actually a private sector panel. It's advising us on what we're missing, ways that private sector can partner with us. And so even just reaching out to DEED is helpful because we're looking for ideas for partnership on economic security. If you got a discrete thing you, you can do, like all the firms that are now shifting to create you know, face shields and other PPE for, for critical care workers, there, there are very distinct lines there. But if you've got brainstorms and ideas, reaching out to us at DEED is, is a great start. And you know, it's government alone isn't going to get us through this. That's, that's been clear from the very beginning. So we're we're grateful, never more grateful to have such a more, such a civically minded business community in the state as we are now. Can you share an example of a maybe a surprising or interesting partnership that's happened yet? Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch. We were just talking to the guys from Wyoming or the, the gals, I should say, from, from Wyoming Machine the other day uh, over in Wyoming. Tracy. Yeah, they're incredible. Tracy Toppany, they make metal fabrication parts and they've retooled their assembly lines to make ventilator parts for ventilators to mm. be built. Um, you know, we've seen Frost River up in Duluth, the bag making company shift to making face shields. Woodchuck USA has done that here in the Metro as well. That's a company that like makes journals and like corporate Boxes. gifts. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. And they're turning out face shields. So you're seeing a lot of that and uh, I know we'll see more. Great. Another specific thing I wanted to make sure we talked about was Minnesota's shared work program. Could you talk a little bit about that and why that's an important tool for employers to keep in mind too? Yeah, you know, our goal, and I think it's everyone's goal, is to keep as many people connected to work as possible. You know, the very min bare minimum for health insurance reasons, but, you know, even beyond that, so that they're getting some degree of payment or wages at this time. And that's really hard when cost, uh, when cost pressures are, are growing. And so shared work basically is a program that incentivizes an employer to not lay people off, to say, okay, rather than, if I need to cut my costs, rather than just lay off this section of the business, if I decrease the hours of everybody across a bunch of different units, say from 40 to 20 or whatever it might be, yeah. unemployment insurance can kick in and make up some of that gap so that your worker who's working less hours now actually gets unemployment insurance benefits to make up some of the, some of the difference in, in their wage differentiation. 
Usually you'd only give unemployment insurance benefits if the employee was let go, but shared work allows them to still do some work and get those benefits. So it's a popular program right now. We're taking in a record number of applications um, and we're getting good feedback from employers and where we're getting that right and, and where we're not is it is a more complex thing to apply for just by the nature of how we do some of the calculations. But I'd encourage every employer who can to apply for it. We've got to keep as many Minnesotans connected to their jobs because look, we're going to get through this. Like this is going to be over at some point and hopefully sooner rather than later. And when it is, the more people that are connected to a job, you know, the better this will be. If you're, if you're, if you're out there and you have to then reapply, there's just these huge transition costs in HR and hiring and job search. And it's just tough. So, yeah. you know, we know it's not possible for every business and we know that these are really challenging times, but if you can do it, shared work is a great place to, to take a first step. Certainly, in addition to all the things you said, you just think about the mental health and the, the anxiety mm. of people you know that there is, a, there, there is a chance to go back. Yep, to, no, no question. Right, but, but we can go back. Uh, I want to switch gears a little bit. We've seen great bipartisan support for the governor's actions to date, and as I've shared with you a couple of times, I hear nothing but just really positive and uh, a great deal of appreciation for the way your whole team, uh, uh, led by the governor, um, have been conducting yourselves in all this. Some legislators have raised some questions or even concerns about uh, decisions. Are there additional actions under consideration that are gonna require legislative action? And if so, what kind of timelines are we talking about and how can the rest of us be helpful as that process goes forward? Yeah, it's, it's important, right? I mean, any solution that the governor does with the legislature is gonna be better and more accepted and stable by the people of this state than something he has to do by executive order. And he, right. as a former legislator himself, he, he believes that in his bones. So it is important. As, as you know, right now, the, the legislature is not in session. Actually, just before I hopped on this call, I joined a, a meeting of the Senate uh, work group on, on jobs in the economy uh, of senators who are asking questions about you know how we're progressing and um, I think that's an important step. What they're telling us is April 14th looks like roughly the date they may come back. I, I'm you know I think they're still evaluating various things. So we are kicking up another series of proposals in collaboration with the legislature because yes the governor has executive uh, order power right now, but that does not allow him to to use general fund money. He can't appropriate money with that power. So. The, their limitations. It's not like the governor just becomes, you know, king for the right. king for the year with that with that emergency order. So we're very focused on it. I think one of the things that has reached our radar recently that we're going to be talking about a lot is that given this increase in unemployment insurance benefits by six hundred dollars a week, which is great, it, it'll help workers, you know, uh, survive this time. It actually may incentivize people to to stay on, on unemployment longer than they otherwise might have, and it and it won't help critical care workers who have to stay at work desperately because we need them, but often paid very low wages. Yeah. So how do you incentivize a critical care worker to not sort of give up and say, my gosh, like my neighbors get more money by going on unemployment and I got to go on the front lines, in the epicenter of the battle and I'm getting paid less. That's just not fair. Right. So that's, that's a vexing challenge that we didn't create. Obviously the federal government gave us a new benefit and we're going to get that money from Minnesotans, but it, it does make me worry that critical care workers are going to really be squeezed. Yeah. you know, in the coming weeks. So we're looking at ways we can engage the legislature. Can we make up some of that gap through some general fund money? I, I don't know. We're going to, we're going to navigate that, but we've got to help those in the front lines. They're the ones who deserve the help, need the help. And um, that's something I hope this legislature, this, this coming uh, next uh, convening legislature that we can tackle. Have a chance to do. We'll talk in a few more minutes about some of the other longer term things, but I can't help but say I've been doing some writing already about those of us not on the front lines. We have to be thinking about what's going to be different um, in the future. And one clearly is of these people who have been described as essential workers. I mean, that changes the way you have to think about the value of that work. Oh, God. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see, you know, as we, I, I, you guys have got to stay focused on the balance in this short term, but I think there are some really long-term conversations that are going to be uh, challenging for all of us too. So no question. speaking of challenging, uh, let's talk for a sec about um, the federal government. Um, I think we all know, read it and we see it in the news, coordination with the federal government on COVID-19 got off to an un, just less than perfect start. Um, but is the interaction getting better? Are there still big needs that are not being met from your vantage point as you think about economic security? Well, it has been challenging to say the least. I think that I will just say this. I feel grateful to be in a state where our governor is open, honest, forward-leaning, examines data, 
isn't blustering and is just giving it to us straight and prioritizing the health of, of our citizens. I'll just leave, maybe leave it at that. Yeah. Um, it has gotten better uh, a little bit, at least in our realm, in terms of our relationships with the Department of Labor, who's kind of our federal federal partner in all of this. Um, and I have sympathy for them because they're navigating a lot as they roll these programs out and there's some super complex decisions. But we're gonna keep pushing them because these benefits that came out of the CARES Act are critical and states are, are really uh, limited in engaging on them until we get further guidance. And so, you know, uh, we're, we appreciate that it takes some time to get that right. And, and we know that we need to be patient to some extent, but for some people, they just don't have, for many people, and I hear from them every day, they don't have time to be patient. They don't want to hear us say, be patient, we're awaiting guidance. They want to say, give me my money now so I can feed my kids and stay afloat and make rent. And so we're going to keep pushing very hard for that. Um, and I'll say that, you know, one of the things that's been beneficial for us is, is to be in some of these national conversations. We get on calls pretty regularly with the, with the NGA, that's the National Governors Association, um, with NASWA, which is the National Association of Workforce uh, Groups, just to hear what other states are doing and get ideas. I think you have this moment in our history where states really having to exhibit leadership at times where it's lacking from the federal government. And so these kind of decisions are being made by governors, this kind of laboratory of democracy that's taking place around the country. It's it's critical that we're, we're sharing information quickly and where stuff's working, we accelerate and amplify it and where stuff's not, we dump it and move on. And that's kind of the exercise that we're, yeah, yeah. we're all going through. I can't help but share, I was on a call earlier this morning, I'm on the board of um, Hennepin Health and mm. Jennifer DiCabellas, who's the new CEO there, was talking about all of the healthcare um, system leaders get together a couple times a week and, and that same kind of sharing of information and figuring out how do we make sure we're taking care of Minnesotans and it's not about whose balance sheet it ends up on. It's we've got to be, we've got to figure this out it's sort of real time. So I assume there's a parallel. Universe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think those, it's been good to see various sector groups, you know, in the state kind of come together at this time to share, share thinking. Yeah. How about um, counties and municipalities? You mentioned one uh, um, instance already that asking them to get into the loan business and I had not caught up with that. So that was interesting. What else are we asking our, those other units of government to shoulder and how is that going? Yeah, I do think that revolving loan fund is a big one to free up some of that money. We do a, a call three times a week at 7 a.m. With, with chambers of commerce you know, across the state and and other business association and trade leaders just to get feedback from them and hear what's working and what isn't. So a part of it is just information sharing. You know, we're, we're, we're essentially standing up like a dozen new programs at once that all have very specific details around them that just need need time to flesh out and explain. So, I mean, as, as Tunheim has well shown, good communication is critical here. And so we're, we're doing our best to get that right. You know, with, uh, with states and cities, I think, or sorry, states and counties, or cities and counties, you know, we don't think they need to shoulder the financial burden of this. That's for the state and the federal government to be able to do, but where we can help them take advantage of local funds, where we can coordinate some of the thinking across cities and, and counties in ways that um, that help kind of share best practices, I think that's a good role for the state government uh, to play. That makes sense, that makes sense. So in Minnesota, we talk about stay at home men, as opposed to shelter in place, which seems to be the term of art around the country. Um, was that a was that a um, discussion that we wanted to do it in a unique Minnesota way, or did that just happen because that's the way the governor talked about it? Talk about no, it. it was it was a discussion. It was a communications discussion, really. And, and Kristen Beckman and the and the comms team gave this a lot of thought. The governor himself, who's a, a great communicator, gave it some thought. Shelter in place makes you feel like there's a tornado outside. You know, it just has this kind of feel of like the sirens are rolling and all hell's breaking loose and you better go hide. And that's just not the kind of panic that we wanted to spark in our community. And I think stay at home says the same thing, but in a much more thoughtful way. Yep. And I think that's taken off. I think, you know, the Minnesota model, cause you bring it up, I think it has been to try to communicate calmly, thoughtfully, to be very planful. And for any time a decision is made, for us to, to think through the effects of that decision ahead of time and try to put some things in place that will mitigate those effects. And the governor himself will say, we're not gonna get that perfect. Every, these decisions are, are extremely imperfect uh, and they're extremely difficult. But if there's things that we can put into place that kind of ameliorate some of the effects of them, then that's, that's what we wanna do as Minnesota. We've watched several other states just kind of, you know, make tough decisions, no question, but just have to make them and let it all play out from there. 
And I think, you know, we've had the benefit of not being in the state that say New York or Florida or California is the number of cases that we are, which we're grateful for at this point, to be able to be a little more planful than maybe some of those states don't have the luxury of being so that the Minnesotans can understand this. And I think you've seen that play out in, in positive ways. I mean, we've gotten good rankings on the stay for home uh, sort of social distancing metrics that are done by various cell phone companies that track essentially movements of people and ensure that people are keeping their distance. I think, um, you know, crime hasn't spiked like you might be concerned that it would. Um, so, you know, Minnesotans should take pride in our ability to come together and navigate these moments. And I think part of that is to your point, the messaging and how we frame it up for people and how we want Minnesotans to think about this time. Right. So talk a little bit about the process that you guys have to go through. I, I, my understanding is that almost 80% of jobs in the state of Minnesota are deemed essential. Is that right, first of all, that data point? And then just talk a little bit about that process of deciding um, how, to de how to decide who needs to stay home and who needs to go to work. Yeah. <clears throat> Every once in a while, we step back and scratch our heads and go, my God, like we're the department that's set up to grow the economy. And our key strategic goal right now is to figure out how to pause it. It's, it's truly mind boggling. Uh, mind -boggling. Um, so it was a very, a very long discussion. I think, you know, we want to look for any canonical source of data we can in a situation like that. So the Department of Homeland Security has this list of industries it's called CISA, critical infrastructure industries, essentially, that we started with. But we didn't just want to take that and say, okay, we'll just use CISA and move on. We wanted to say, well, are, could, we, could we go further than that? Could we get, keep more businesses moving if we're thoughtful about, about the approach? And so we were able to kind of do what we call CISA plus, if you will. We looked at CISA, which is this national database, and we added some that we felt like, given the unique nature of our economy, who works here, let's add some industries. Um, and then to make it a little bit more clearly clear, we use what's called NAICS codes, not to get too much into the weeds, but essentially it's occupation codes. So we got into job types so that if you're – if you run a business and you're not sure which industry you're in or you're on the fence of a few, you can go into the actual job code and see like, do I qualify or not? But I'll say this, you know, we started out with guidance and it, we started out at like 78% of, of the jobs in the state that were critical. Uh, and we knew we had to be kind of open to what would then come in in terms of requests for clarification. And we're now up to 82% are critical. And that's, okay. that just speaks to having had a process where we're going to engage a business community. We're going to learn from them. We're going to hear, what's critical and what's not and be not not be afraid to change our mind where we need to because you know it's impossible to get an order like that right on the first time and i think the governor asked us to be open and, and have a process by which people could submit and engage further and that's what we've done and so i will say this like when we first talked about shutting down non-critical industries i just in my head i thought oh my gosh that's like the entire economy but when you get down to it, and it's really only 18% of the jobs in the state, I don't mean to say to sort of downplay how devastating of a thing it is. I know that it's devastating, but it's certainly not the kind of percentage that you might think when you begin that you'd end up at. And so, yeah, we'll no, that's the reaction when I saw the statistic. I thought huh. okay, it does make it feel like there's another, there's, we can get to the other side of this. Right, right. right. We can get our way through that. You've talked about communications a couple of times, which I know we agree it's incredibly important in this situation. And the state seems to me to be working really hard to communicate with lots of different stakeholders. You've talked about some of the regular um, cadence that you're in with various folks around the state. Are there new collaborative measures that are being created um, between agencies uh, at this time uh, that didn't exist previously? Give us a little bit of insight into how this feels. Yeah, yeah. You know, we it's 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 evolved. I would say. You know, we started out. I wouldn't say in our own silos, but certainly in our in our own chairs as you know, uh, leaders of agencies looking at okay, what's the deed approach going to be? What's MDH going to be? What's uh, you know, what's commerce and others going to do? Um, but we realized, and I think the governor realized, sort of a week or two in, that in fact probably the best way to attack this is yes, agencies should do what they do best, but we also need some interagency groups that are going to focus on very discrete topics, and so. You know, I think, um, you know, these groups on, on critical care capacity, on, uh, on ventilators, on testing amounts, uh, on, on PPE, these kind of goal focused groups get, get agencies aligned on a particular mission and a metric and a goal yeah. that everyone has to collaborate on. And that becomes kind of the galvanizing force. And you'll see even just later today, more announcements from the governor on how he wants to navigate that for, for the state and how he wants to communicate that to the state. Because the idea here is, Stay at home was never about, all right, everyone just chill for two weeks and 
we'll be back. We'll, we'll be back after the break. <laughs> you know, it, it was very much let's use this time, right? And so we have just we've our efforts have only accelerated during this time to partner with the private sector and use this time to set goals. We want to be transparent about those goals with the public and let them know what we're trying to achieve to get Minnesota ready for what we know will be an increase in cases and for what we know will be further further challenges economically. So that's been important. And then just in terms of communication, it's it is so much information to dispense to so many different audiences. And I think one of the things that you know we've learned from consultation with with you, Kathy, and, and other experts in the field is just to think nimbly about this and. Well, you want to have clear, consistent messages across the board, you've also got to think about your audience. And so, you know, we're looking into sort of ethnic media opportunities, uh, you know, greater Minnesota media opportunities. And also, how do you give an audience enough of the idea such that they can take it and organically turn it into something else that matches their audience's needs? That, that's where social media, that's where the internet is so good at disseminating information. And so that's, I think, a big communications challenge for us right now is how, how do we liberate other Minnesotans to be the best messengers by taking what we're sharing and, and, and then, you know, reamplifying it to their, right. their audiences. Right. Well, I, I, I know we're early in this process yet, I know, but I, I just have to say on behalf of lots of people, I think you guys have done a remarkable job of, of re continuing to process that to say, all right, what do we need to communicate today and how do we need, what are our options for how to do it, knowing that the next day it's the Challenges are going to be different. Yeah, yeah. Going to be different too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, back to deed specific, and, and and this is at the risk of sounding like I'm moving past the acute phase that we're in. I acknowledge we're still in this acute phase, but has this environment, has this crisis highlighted any existing, I'll call them cracks in the state's workforce training programs or systems? Mm -hmm. Well, here comes to mind uh, that employees and their employees rely upon. I mean. What are some learnings that you're already starting to jot down to say we got to come back to this? Yeah, it's a it's a important strategic issue and, and question. Yes, it has. I, I would say that in many ways it just I think it it highlighted things we already knew were challenges, but it kind of gave us the permission to tackle them in a new way. And, and I guess one example would just be our virtual service delivery. You know, we as a workforce system, for example, in the state have been very, are very focused on brick and mortar. You know, we got 50 different, they used to be called workforce centers, we now call them career force centers across the state where someone can walk in and apply for a job and get one-on-one -on -one counseling and, and physical space and physical buildings do matter. But if you were building a workforce system from scratch today, I don't know if that's where you would start. You, you would probably start with the internet and with, with you know, mobile distribution and virtual services and other ways for people to access content. And so, we have had to, because of the stay-at-home order and health concerns, actually shut the doors of all those career force centers. So we're suddenly in a situation where we don't just get to like tinker with a side project and how we're going to have a digital strategy. Like that's the strategy. <laughs> right, 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 right. And yeah. so, yeah, like whether it's, you know, phone calls or, or video conferences, we're doing a lot of this kind of thing with the folks. It, you know, we're trying to, we have a whole work group set up between both the, the leaders inside of the department, but also private sector leaders in this space to come up with new ways to deliver services. Because at the same time that we're having to close our physical doors, more people are unemployed in the state than have yeah. been unemployed for you know decades. And so the services are actually more important than they ever were before at a time where we have to deliver them differently. So it's forcing us to innovate in ways that I think are ultimately going to be helpful for us. No one would ever wish a crisis like this upon ourselves, but there's going to be things that come out of this that are better than when we started because this has forced us to think in new ways. Yeah. I mean, it's the famous, uh, you know, never waste a good crisis kind right. of leadership messages. Um, and you think about what, how to capture those learnings and when and how to share them. What's, what's the right timing for that? Um, um, is there a push to rethink how to make some investments in Minnesota? And maybe this is part of what you guys are, are looking forward to with the, in talking with the legislature. And um, what are some of those capabilities that we need to be willing to make investments in in Minnesota that this crisis is really highlighting for us? For example, there's been a lot of discussion about e-learning e -learning, uh, and um, work from home in the past, right? Um, all of a sudden, as you say, that it's not an idea now. It, it is the strategy to some extent. Yeah, yeah. But uh, do we have the infrastructure in place to um, to fully take advantage of what we're learning. Yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, broadband comes to mind right away. And that's been something that, you know, the governor and our administration have championed from the beginning. I think um, we're at about 90% penetration at kind of the, the bare minimum speed you would want, but uh, we, we need to do better than that. And every additional percentage is harder to get. And 
So one of the things that the school distance learning school project has shown us is that you know, broadband is essential. And for many people, even if they have access to it, they don't buy it because it's too expensive. Yeah. So, you know, what do we do to increase broadband in the coming legislative session? Can we get some more money there to get more lines in the ground? I think that's a, a critical piece and to improve speeds. And, you know, we're thinking like, do we, is there some kind of a subsidy program for families who can't afford it to get it now when it's more important than before? So I think staying connected is a big one. I think this critical care issue that I mentioned before is just really important. You know, the governor says this time and again that these people that we always took for granted and you kind of just look past as you're at the grocery aisle or, you know, at, right. at a hospital or, or some other place are suddenly, you know, Superman and Wonder Woman. Like they're the people that are keeping us going. And so how we think about the safety net for those people, I think is critical. We've been for some time really advocating for paid family medical leave, for example. You know, it is it is embarrassing as a country that we are so behind the times in this in, in this global environment in terms of providing for the most vulnerable when they need that help. And by that, I mean, when a parent has a child, being able to leave their job to take care of that child and not have to take an economic hit at a moment when they actually have increased spending required to take care of that kid or needing to step aside for health considerations or take care of a, a loved one because they're experiencing illness. You know, many states have done this. We have not. Um, we're the kind of state that is prized being a great place for workers. And I think we need to continue to do that. And so pay for medical leave comes up as another obvious, I don't anticipate that's gonna get done this session. Uh, so we're, real, we're realistic about that given where the Senate is on this issue. But I don't think there's ever been a time where pay for medical leave hasn't been more clearly in view as a critical policy lever for an economy and especially for those workers who don't work for a company that pays them a good wage and adds this as a benefit because it's the right thing to do, but who are working hourly wage jobs at companies that don't have to offer that kind of incentive on their own. So I see those are some of the things that, that stick out. Absolutely. You know, Steve, talk a little bit about um, retraining of workers. This is a whole other area that uh, your department touches. We have some of those tools and, and programs in place, but Another thing you have to start to imagine as we come out of this is that there are going to be um, kinds of jobs that either don't exist anymore or to your point have to be you know, compensated differently. Do we have the infrastructure around training and retraining of people as the economy on the other side of this is going to have some fundamentally different characteristics? The short answer is no. And then the long answer is exactly what does no mean, right? And I don't know if any state would be able to say unequivocally yes. You're ready, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even even before this crisis, we've been involved in a research project on what you might call the future of work, which is to say, we know jobs are changing at a rapid pace. Automation or artificial intelligence are changing the tasks that people do versus machines do. Are we ready as a state for the economy that we see coming 10 years down the line? And I think we know the answer is probably no, again, but then what does that mean in, in, the, in the more specific answer to the question? So I think one of the things we are gonna need to continue to focus on is just what is what is technology and and uh you know artificial intelligence automation mean for how we prepare our economy for the future what do crises like this show us about the jobs and tasks that can be automated versus the jobs and tasks that can't um you know what do we learn from that we can't waste the opportunity to learn from this crisis as it relates to those things and then the question to your point kathy is then so what does state government do about it and do we have good mid-career training programs for someone to sort of shift a career halfway through if they kind of see on the horizon like this, this job as a retail clerk is not going to be here for a while. How do I start now and avoid getting fired later to, to transition? And so, you know, we mid mid-career training programs haven't had the best reputation, just generally speaking, like the, the, the great models are out there, but there's, they're fewer and further between. So I think that's, it's just a huge opportunity for innovation for us in the state. And this crisis, I think, can help us do that, you know, in the coming months and years. And just to follow up on that, are there, are there good examples about around the country, around the world, about who takes on that responsibility? How much of that is government responsibility versus industry responsibility versus philanthropy, you know, whatever? Yeah. And that's something we always ask ourselves at Deed because we can't be, we can't do everything. And we know that the best kinds of training partnerships happen with business deeply involved. You know, we got into this space in the training world for workforce over the past 30 years where the government took an increasingly large role here just because companies felt less incentivized to do training because 
people change jobs every seven years. Yep. You know, previous generations, people got a job, stay for 30. It made sense to invest in that worker. We still think it makes sense to invest in the worker, but we understand employers thinking, well, gosh, I'm not going to put an expensive training program in place if my guy's going to leave in a couple of years. So government's played more of an increasing role, but it's been a little bit to the detriment of the worker because government's never going to train you as well as a business could. And that's just a fact. So I think the big thing here is partnership. Like how do we make sure that businesses are involved in all the training programs that government does such that there's a job at the end of that training pipeline and that we're doing the right stuff versus just kind of training you and then sending you off into the market to find a job when, you know, we, yeah, good luck. Right. You don't want to do that. No one wants to do that. So I think it's a good time to rethink some of those models and, and, you know, we've been doing that already, but this will accelerate it. I think. Yeah, I, I hope that those in the, in the audience listening to us, if you're in the private sector, I hope we all are taking the opportunity to reflect on what role we need to play in that, both in terms of specifying what the work is. I, I, I know in the past, that was one of the things I found really interesting, that there's this uh, intention to rely on government uh, without taking the responsibility to make sure the government understands what it is we need. Um, um, exactly. On the private sector side. So. I'll look forward to working in whatever ways we can on that uh, together. You used the phrase a few minutes ago, laboratory for democracy, and I know that's something that you've talked about before. Um, so in that spirit, so share that philosophy with us a little bit, share a little bit about the experience you're having. And um, I wanna make sure the listeners have an opportunity to, to feel as confident as I do about your leadership and, and the governor's leadership, because it's, it's an incredibly thoughtful process and, and uh, orientation that you bring to this. So just share a little bit about your thinking. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, you know, particularly given where things are at the federal level, I think states have had to lean in heavily. And, and the, to the sense that's a gift, it's that, you know, we get to try stuff and we get to try stuff and share it and learn across states and across governments and, and adapt and improve programs by sharing and trying things. And I think one of the things that governments don't do well is try and fail because they're so nervous to try stuff that then fails and then blows up in the public and all the spotlights on you. And suddenly, you know, you should never tried that. And that's something for me, you know, coming from a company like Google where trying and failing is something you got rewarded for in government, <laughs> you get punished for it. Right. right. So, so it's, part it's of it's such an important thing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And so part of the trick is how do you create the sa a safe space where you can, you can try some things and fail and, and then try them again. And maybe there's certain things you're not going to try to fail at because you can't, have your unemployment insurance system crash or other things right. fall through the cracks, but there's certainly a lot you can try. And so how do you create that safe space inside of government is a big question. We're in the process. We've only accelerated it by the way, since this crisis began of creating an innovation lab inside of deed that brings in some private sector experts, those who've, who've done this kind of work in governments before to create that kind of a space for our employees to give them a chance to bring new ideas and, and again, try stuff and mm -hmm. see if it works. And then there's just this, this broader point of how do we share ideas across states? I'll give you an example of this. In the past few weeks, you know, we would figure out what do we do for small businesses? And we talked about some of those programs a moment ago. I get a report from a researcher on my team every day of the new stuff states are trying. And as I look at those reports, one of the things was, okay, so in Massachusetts, they started a small business loan program that had, you know, I think $10 million in it, but they let the cap be $75,000. And as soon as they launched it, it was depleted in three days. Right. And so, you know, suddenly you're like, okay, well, we're going to learn from that test and we're going to do, we're going to lower our cap to 35 K and we're going to put 30 million in it. That's just the kind of stuff that, and, and I, every state's trying to figure this out, but you got to learn from other, other attempts in other states and other cities and, and counties and try to try to just move quick and, and, yeah. you know, try, try new things. I think it's, I'm, I'm really energized to hear you talk about it. That was, I, I know we have extraordinary public, um, employees uh, across the state of Minnesota. Um, lots of great experience, lots of great energy, um, and needing to be needing to be given the opportunity to be innovative and creative. Um, and as you say, not be penalized for it. Yeah, yeah. It's great. Steve, what have I not asked you about that you want to make sure a bunch of folks in the business community need to hear? Anything that we haven't covered? I really appreciate um, the sharing of the information. I know, as I said at the outset, there's been um, on the right side of the screen, lots of additional information that um, came from your team that we've been posting and, and we'll continue to do that as we push this out. Yeah. Anything we missed that? You know, I, I would say, no, you, this has been a very, very thorough set of questions and a, a great opportunity for us. So thank you for the chance to, to engage uh, your audience with the, this 
conversation. I think the, you know, the business community listens to you, listens to Tunheim, and so we're grateful for the chance to to connect with with them here. I think, you know, we've covered a lot of bases. I would say that, you know, our our big ask is just to ask every business, every business leader, to try to continue to exercise leadership in your own communities to to keep keep people calm, to listen to them, to know how painful and hard this is. Um, and I guess the message I would want government to share in that context is just, we know we're not getting all this right. Like we know that there's, there's so many decisions that have been made that aren't perfect. What the governor tells us is don't let perfect be the enemy of the good, you know, make thoughtful decisions, move forward. You know, he's making a lot of tough decisions with imperfect information. We all are. But if we just stay calm, look at the data, share information, be planful, work together, you know, as a community, I think we'll go a long ways. And I'll just say again, as, as someone who kind of came back to the state after having been gone for 20 years and, and just kind of getting introduced to this business community myself for the past couple of years, I've never been more grateful to be in a state where business and government have the kind of relationship that we do here. And, and frankly, just where we have a business community that has such a civically minded perspective. Um, it, we are so lucky in this state. That's not hyperbole. It's just true. Um, and we're grateful for it. So to all the business leaders watching, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please keep reaching out to us. Please keep doing stuff on your own. We're seeing so much great organic activity. It's going to take that kind of collective energy to get us through this and we will get through it. That's what people need to remember. And it will be painful and hard, but there's going to be another side of this and we're going to make sure it's, it's even better than where we were before. And that's going to take all of us working together. So Thanks, Kathy. Well, let me add my thanks to you, Steve, uh, for joining us today. I want to thank the Tunheim team who made this possible. Uh, we're hosting another mini commercial here. We're also hosting complimentary uh, office hours by appointment. If there are organizations out there who just who need some advice and some counsel, there's a link on the chat bar. Uh, go ahead and sign up and get some free uh, time with one of our senior folks um, to give you some advice. As I said earlier, um, there will be a recording of this discussion later today uh, on Tunheim's LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram channel. So look for that. If you uh, have the opportunity to share it with those who weren't able to join us, that would be great. And you can follow us there for notification of other potential uh, future webinars. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks again, Steve. Stay home, everybody. Stay safe. Be well. Thanks, Kathy. Bye. Thanks, Steve.